everybody. Uh, welcome to our Metabolomics Grand Challenges webinar series. Uh, this is our fifth presentation and today our topic is metabolomic standards. Uh, simply a review and a call to practice. I'm your host, um, Dr. Le Le Lloyd Sumner, and I'm joined by Dan Bearden and Sutanika Ray online. I apologize, I've got a little bit of cold, so I might have a funny sound coming over the air today, but I hope we can work through this uh, together. All right, uh, having a little bit of a technical difficulty. There we go. Um, just a reminder that this is part of a webinar series where we're discussing the grand challenges and this has been our schedule so far. This is number five of a long list of presentations uh, that we will discuss uh, revolving around the grand challenges of metabolomics. I'd like to point out uh, that we have two more scheduled for December and January. I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and mark your calendars for December 2nd where Philip uh, Brits McKibben will talk about us, uh, improving metabolomics cost, throughput, and data comparability. And then on January 6th, Dan Jones uh, will talk to us about advancing large-scale quantification uh, and flux. We have um, later in April another scheduled uh, webinar for talking about dynamic range and depth of coverage, and this will be led by Liang Li. Um, we have a couple others that uh, we do not have a host for yet, uh, so if you're interested in volunteering, uh, let us know. But uh, we, we have one that we really want to uh, get lined out is the data interpretation uh, webinar. This was voted as a uh, the number two grand challenge that we face and uh, we look forward to that presentation. And then finally we, we want to talk about the exposome and environmental impacts uh, and related to health and uh, this uh, again we need uh, volunteers for this and as we continue to organize them we'll, we'll keep you posted and provide greater or more details at a later time. So as a reminder, uh, just a little bit about the webinar logistics. Uh, you should see your uh, GoToMeeting webinar uh, pane here. Uh, essentially, we ask that you sign in using your name and looking through the list. It does look like most everybody's done that. If you did not sign in with your name, but uh, you, the only way to do it uh, is to sign out and re-log on. And we just ask to have your name so that we have an accurate record of who's been participating. Um, in the webinar pane, if you have questions, technical questions, uh, Sutanika is standing by uh, to try to help you with those. So if you can't hear or if you can't see videos, please type those in the chat pane uh, in the lower area over here. If you have uh, questions of a scientific nature, we ask that you enter them using the, the question icon uh, in your screen. And then if you can raise your hand at later points if you would like to ask additional questions. So during the first 15, 20 minutes of the presentation, uh, all the attendees will be on mute. And then as we get into the discussion or question and answer time, we will unmute people uh, as we work through those questions and answers. And we encourage you to participate. So our goals, if you remember, are to have a 15, 20 minute presentation and uh, then open it up for the discussion. And we really seek public uh, feedback uh, during this time. We generally allow an hour for this uh, type of conversation in total, uh, but we typically have gone well over that and uh, can go up to an hour and a half. And uh, our goals are, again, to discuss, uh, vet, and prioritize uh, the grand challenges. And specifically today, we're gonna talk about standardizations of workflows and, and data acquisition and data analysis. From this, we, we hope to build a better consensus of what the community is thinking related to standards and or other grand challenges. And we hope that this uh, provides an additional opportunity for uh, members of the community to voice their opinions and to net with, network with others to help to begin to build uh, additional solutions to these grand challenges that we face uh, in, in today's environment. So um, it's my pleasure to do this myself. Uh, 
I'm your host and speaker for today. I'm not an expert in metabolomic standards. I have participated in quite a few, but I volunteer to handle or to, to lead this discussion today. Many of you may know I've been at the Noble Foundation for 16 years, um, but uh, many of you will also be surprised to know that I'm moving, uh, moving to the University of Missouri, and I officially start there January 1st. Uh, of 2016, and we'll be moving our research lab as well as uh, uh, building a new metabolomic center there. So again, my voice is a little delicate today, so I had to pause, take a drink of water. But today, uh, again, I would like to visit with you about the metabolomic standards. And this is, again, a review of what's happened in the past and a call to practice. And what I would like to first do is, is to start with some poll questions to get a better understanding of what uh, you know people are aware of and where the junior community community uh, knowledge is at. So Dan, uh, is it possible to start our first half of our poll questions? You can see yeah. these pre previewed here, uh, but Dan will actually uh, bring on the live poll so that we can begin to get some quantitative feedback from the members online. All right. So we currently have approximately 60 members online, and so go ahead, Dan. Uh, first question is, are you aware of the Metabolomic Standard Initiative? So select yes or no if you wouldn't mind. And it looks like people are filling in quite rapidly. Um, and yeah, so they figured out the logistics already. So. Uh, it right. looks like 73% are uh, aware of these, and so that's a, uh, we have a fairly informed audience. And uh, another 27% are, are unaware of this, and so hopefully through today's seminar we can uh, address some of those. All right, second, second question. Have you read Jenkins et al., a proposed framework for the description of plant metabolomics experiments and the results in nature biotechnology? Uh, kind of an inversion in, in the numbers. Many people are not aware of that, you know, or 80% are, are not aware of that uh, early publication. Okay. Okay. Closing the poll. 93% voted. That's great. Thank you, folks. Okay. Next question. Have you read Beano et al., uh, Potential of Metabolomics as a Functional Genomics Tool in Plant and Trends in Plant Science, 2004? Similar numbers uh, showing up, uh, but uh, um, as a plant scientist, I'm more aware of these journals, and so I'm, uh, I understand we have a mixed audience. But 91% uh, voted. All right. Closing that poll. Okay. Next question. Um, are you, have you read Lyndon et al. summary of recommendations for standardization and reporting of metabolic analysis in Nature Biotech again in 2005? So this is the numbers. Uh, the yeses are a little bit higher on this one. We're around 40 percent. Um, uh, suggesting a higher impact of this group, and this was a, a much larger initiative, and we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail here shortly. Okay, closing that one. Um, okay, are you aware of the special issue of the journal Metabolomics, which published a large number of articles related to the Metabolomic Standard Initiative? Uh, I have to use some shorthand on the wording here because the polls are limited in number of characters you can have. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, 90% have voted. That's about split on this one. Yeah, but it's uh, our, our numbers of yeses are growing. With uh, this one, uh, looks like topping out about 55%. So over half the audience are aware of that that special issue. And the next question. Um, have you read uh, Fien et al., 
the Metabolomic Standard Initiative and Metabolomic <coughs> 2007 or other standards article in that issue. I don't. I think there's what about 10 or 12 articles in that issue. Yeah, there's quite a few. All right, so almost 70 percent on that last poll question. All right, back to you, Lloyd. That's All right, uh, thank you, folks, uh, for your voting. Um, this really does provide quantitative feedback, uh, which helps us better understand and uh, let others know generally about the community consensus. Um, these are, are listed here because uh, they're going to be part of the presentation uh, today, and we're going to discuss them in a little bit of detail. So I kind of want to flash back to about 2000 to 2005 time frame. During this time frame, uh, the first metabolomics articles were published. Uh, the first metabolomics conference was held in the Netherlands. Um, the Metabolomics Society was formed in approximately 2004. From this, the Metabolomics Journal was launched. And multiple gr groups began to think and began to discuss the idea of, of data standards and how best to you know, ensure that these standards uh, allow us to generate data that we can uh, share and exchange and, and reuse. And this led to a series of, of publications. And oops, almost forgot about the Metabol meeting uh, in, in 20, 2005. Um, and again, these were all earlier efforts uh, in metabolomics and that began the discussion along the lines of standards. And so the first publication um, was in 2004. Uh, this was not necessarily uh, the uh, earliest conversations. But in 2004, uh, Jenkins et al. Uh, proposed a framework for the description of plant metabolomics experiments. And this was a Nature Tech Biotech publication. And really, this began to conceptualize the data and the relationships between data as we get, began to publish. And as part of that, they um, uh, outlined several things, and uh, they are shown here. And they, they began to group the, the data and information into an administrative block, into a biological source. With that was related growth conditions, treatments, and environments uh, associated with that biological tissue. Uh, then the sampling, and uh, the collection of that sampling, uh, and the processing of that sampling for analysis. Then they included uh, 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 data for instrumental analysis and then um, the output uh, of that. And so uh, this is one of the early publications that began to talk about uh, metabolomic standards and it's began to get this out into the literature uh, for others to review. And the, I would encourage you to review this paper as many of you said that you have not or were not aware of it. And then uh, Bino and another set of groups from the plant community uh, began to think about metabolomics within the concepts of functional genomics. And with this idea, uh, they realized that there was an idea or a need for data sharing and standards as well. And they pr proposed briefly a, a minimum information about a metabolomics experiment. And again, this was published in, in 2004. And they, they address very similar issues um, along the lines of experimental design, sample prep, uh, metabolite profiling, and the measurements and, and the out processing of that data. Uh, this article was less uh, detailed, uh, but more or less it was more or less a call uh, for action or the need uh, to uh, you know, begin to think about these concepts. But then the, the, the most comprehensive uh, uh, report came out uh, in, in 2005, and this was uh, the results of several uh, uh, meetings uh, in, in Europe uh, led by the Imperial Group and, and, uh, and Lyndon et al. and published in Nature Biotech. And essentially they, they, they went in great detail and proposed minimum requirements for designing and reporting metabolomic studies. And this began with the biological samples, uh, the processing of that, the analytical treatments or the technologies used for that, and then the actual processing of the data. And this is uh, beginning to be a theme that we, you know, we want to capture information about the biological sample, the analytical technology, and the data processing to ensure reuse and, and or uh, repeat ability of that data analysis. 
And in their, their presentation or their paper, they talked again about experimental design. And they uh, reported that uh, all samples should be uh, reported relative to some type of control in the actual test described. Uh, they were called for the identity of the source information related to the, those uh, biological materials. And they asked uh, and began the descriptive discussion along the lines of controlled vocabularies. And as we begin to think about sharing data, I think the idea of controlled vocabulary becomes very important. Otherwise, you have just a plethora of text strings that, that many use to describe it. They also, along the experimental design, they began to discuss the importance of maintenance um, and the recording of phenotypic characteristics, genetic and genomic uh, data uh, related to that, and with the growth of uh, animals and mammalians, um, the dietary factors and environmental conditions associated with that experiment as well, because all of these can affect the metabolic phenotype that we ultimately measure. They also described uh, sample collections protocols and sample preparation steps. And again, and many of you know that these can significantly influence uh, the quality of the metabolite profile and the relative output of that type of data. They also dug into discussion of the analytical data sets and the formats for them, uh, talking about the experimental context and data formats. Um, they again talked a little bit more about uh, vocabulary and nomenclature, trying to standardize that, and the relative versus absolute concentration. Uh, they began to discuss data exclusions and equipment validation, validation of instrument performance, and uh, how that relates to data quality. And, and you can read on through the list here, and they also uh, began to discuss data processing and then the modeling of the data. And so, you know, one, we want to release data, uh, raw data, but most people, as they're publishing, are not publishing all of the raw data, they're actually processing, uh, processed, or publishing processed data. And so, to better understand that, uh, you know, we need and better be able to repeat that, much of this information needs to be, be recorded and explained so that the data can be reused and repeated. So then uh, about 2005, the Metabolomic Society started what they called the Metabolomic Standards Initiative. And this was really building forward uh, and trying to build a larger community around standardization. And essentially the, the aim was to uh, not to prescribe how an experiment should be done, but to encourage people to describe the work that they've done to make it more usable and repeatable and shareable with others. And this, this was a statement extracted by Oliver's paper at the head of the Metabolomics Journal issue. So, so the Metabolomics Society uh, MSI, or Metabolomics Standard Initiative, was uh, built around five working groups. And these are very similar to the groupings that we saw in some of the earlier publications in that there was biological context uh, metadata groups uh, that actually had subgroups and these were focused around specific uh, uh, species with a mammalian group, a plant group, a cell culture and microbiology group, and an environmental uh, group. And many of these have different types of data that they'd like to capture um, and so this, this group was set to define those uh, metadata that would be uh, uh, informative. Then there was a chemical analysis group uh, assembled, and their job was really to define the minimum information needed to uh, define the, the chemical analysis. There was also a data processing group uh, put together, an ontology group, and a data exchange. And so these groups, uh, over a period of about two years, uh, had numerous meetings and discussions, and this ultimately led to a large series of publications in the Metabolomics Journal, and this was in 2007, and this was volume three, and issue number three. And this is just a table of contents for all of these uh, publications, and as we talked about, there was a biological group being our, our, our task group. And so there was a report uh, on um, the uh, standard reporting requirements uh, for mammalian systems, and then for microbial, for plants, and then also for um, environmental context. 
there was a couple art, uh, articles revolving around chemical analysis, and there was a proposed minimum for standards for chemical analysis by a large group, uh, including myself. And then there was another paper on NMR uh, that involved a, a larger number of NMR specialists. And then there were several pa papers on uh, data processing and uh, the exchange and then the ontology or vocabularies. And so these, all of these uh, uh, issues and articles, I believe, are freely available through the journal. If you're not aware of these, I, I would encourage you to go and download them. And so I've given you many references, and I, I would encourage you to be familiar with these uh, as we begin to continue this discussion on metabolomics uh, um, um, standards. So just a, a few short conclusions uh, that uh, there are numerous metabolomic standards that have been proposed. But there, there's a general belief that we look now eight years or so down the road, eight to ten years down the road, uh, that many of these standards have been poorly uh, adopted and practiced. And so uh, I think that there's a plea from many, uh, many people, including funding agencies, uh, people that would like to reuse the data, people that are beginning to build databases, that uh, we begin to uh, seek a wider adoption and use of these metabolomic standards. So, you know, again, this is a call to action and call to practice that, that we're talking about. So what's been going on recently? Well. Um, uh, more recently, uh, there's been some activity in the area of metabolomics uh, standards, and this is a, a report from the Cosmos Group. And this is an AU Framework 7 program uh, that is really beginning to, you know, reiterate the need for standards and the application of those. And more, more or less, uh, they make an argument that one of the limitations of, uh, why the standards haven't been adopted is that we've not had public repositories uh, for metabolomics data. And so there was uh, less of a need to begin to populate these databases and, and then and you define the metabolomics. And so they, they introduced a, a metabolites uh, database. I'm not quite sure how many uh, data sets they have in there now. I think it's on the order of hundreds, if not approaching the thousands. And there, there are other databases that are out there as well. In the U.S., the new Metabolomics Workbench uh, uh, as part of the NIH uh, initiative as well. But again, these database bases are now beginning to become populated and the need for standardization to allow greater comparability across all of these large data sets um, is, is there. And so there's additional information. They have another call for control vocabularies, which again is beginning important. They propose a, a language, uh, MZML, as the, uh, uh, the most appropriate data exchange, and they're continuing to refine this. And additionally, uh, on the metabolite identification uh, standards, uh, there's been some greater discussions of that. The early publications uh, in 2007 suggested four levels, uh, a very simplistic type of four-level uh, confidence numeric, if you will, for identifying uh, you know, and reporting the confidence in your identification. And so more recently, the, the Metabolite Identification Task Group has published a couple more papers, and, and one these both have appeared in Metabolomics the Journal um, last year, and with the idea of, you know, again, are you sure, or how confident are you in your data, and how do you, you know, uh, transfer that confidence to your peers. And uh, there's another uh, paper by Emma Szymanski that I didn't report here that has expanded on, on that four-level system uh, to uh, provide greater detail and to a level, I think, five levels in that paper. And then more recently, we've suggested a, a more quantitative uh, point system for judging um, uh, metabolite identification confidence and or a, an alternative alphanumeric type of uh, nomenclature that would allow us to assign uh, confidence to the, the identification levels. These are much more complex, and uh, the, the simple, more simplistic four-level system seems to be um, 
gain some traction, but we, we, there is a, a, an agreement that it's it's not enough, and so there's either expand need to expand that, uh, as Emma has reported, or begin to uh, you know develop these other metrics. And so with that, uh, you know, I would like to kind to uh, go through some example data sheets. Um, um, you know, I don't know how many of you use templates, and there's not a lot of templates out there. But early on, uh, Oliver um, and his group developed a template uh, that he shared with us, and we began to uh, use that um, in our own experiments. And to do that, I would like to share an example of that. So typically when we submit uh, data for publication, we, we do so um, in an Excel type of format, and usually we submit process data. And this is an example of a template that we use that is built uh, or extracted from uh, the Metabolomic Standards uh, Initiative uh, suggestions in that we include information related to the source, this including the species, and this is a plant, Metacogra truncatula, uh, with a specific genotype called Gemalong, and we talk about the different organs, and in this report we focused on root organs uh, and a specific cell type called border cells, and we were comparing those to whole roots and root tips. And, uh, you know, we talk about quantity of the material, we talk about the growth conditions uh, for the plants, and these types of parameters change whether you're doing plants or mammals. And again, you, you, you know, I don't know if there's been a, a um, template uh, made for uh, mammalian or microbes, but uh, I think that one could be done so. And I would like to encourage the community to begin to think more about these types of templates and then, you know, developing them with these individual groups. And then, again, we record the treatment. If there was one, this was untreated, so we were looking at differential uh, meta metabolic composition of specific uh, cell types, and so it was all wild-type tissue. And so sometimes there's not an answer or information, and so in those cases, we just report non replicable and, and it just keeps going on. We report harvest time. We report sample processing as part of the analytical or sample prep. And in this case, we did both GCMS analysis and LCMS analysis. So we had sample prep protocols that are quite elaborate in here. They're reported in the paper as well, but they're also reported in detail here. Then we have different uh, instrumental information for the gas, gas chromatography, the system that we use, this Agilent uh, uh, single quad, and uh, the MSD that we used with that. I had information on the instrument performance and method validation um, and how the data was processed. And then we also had data for uh, the LCMS uh, pro protocols as well. And again, I skipped it, but uh, we typically um, have identified our metabolites and we use either a level one identification or the others that we still list as unknown with level two, three, or four type of identifications. And then finally, we, we talk uh, more about the data processing, the output formats uh, and what type of format they are, and then the pre-processing, the peak alignment, and the statistics that we use to go with those. And so this is one, one example. We have other examples as well, and it kind of follows the same template. And this is actually a paper that's been submitted to plant physiology where we're looking again at, at Medicago. And on the output side of the data, we then usually provide a process data format. Uh, this includes the sample name and type, and these were several different ecotypes. We typically retort a retention time, a mass, uh, an accurate mass, and then and, you know whether or not it's unknown. And then we have an internal standard that we often use for standardization. And as you scroll through these, you can see some of these are identified, some of them are unknown, and then there's a relative, relative uh, uh, abundance reported for those. And then if we stand, you know, uh, process that or, or, or normalize that against the internal standard, we often will report different tables with different processing uh, for that. So again, I think templates are, are a very useful tool. I would encourage the uh, community to continue to vet uh, and uh, work in the area of, uh, of those tools. And 
as I switch back to my presentation. I'd like to try to pull, uh, now pause and then actually uh, return to the poll questions. Um, so Dan, can you take over from here? Sure. Let's just please. Um, the whole question is, do you cite any of the metabolomic standards papers when you publish? Okay. Almost 70% have voted. Yeah. Let's go. give them a little bit more time, see if we can get a little bit larger percentage. Yeah. So again, do you cite metabolomic standards papers when you publish? Yes or no? So it's showing to be about 57% yes. Uh, so just a little bit more than half are, are, are citing these publications or the standards papers. Okay. Next question. Do you follow the metabolomic standards guidelines when submitting a manuscript? Right, the numbers are coming in. About 67% are saying yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a little surprised at that because I review a lot of papers, and uh, I would not I would have not have estimated that uh, that the numbers were that high. Maybe we have a biased audience uh, that is much more uh, engaged. Well, may, maybe. Uh there's a, uh, it's not a yes, no, maybe it's a what percentage of the guidelines do you follow? Yeah. The easy ones or the tough ones? All right, next question. Yeah. Oh, come on. What do you estimate is the number of publications that publish near, uh, near MSI compliant data? Yeah, now this is looking a little bit more like I would sus suspect of the literature. So 40, 36% are suggesting, uh, you know, less than 10%, uh, and another 40% are suggesting less than 25%. Uh, so. Okay. So All that's right, very suggestive. Goal suggested that uh, the public opinion is that a large percentage uh, of the publications do not publish MSI compliant or near compliant data. Okay. Um, do you use a template for submitting metabolomics data? Well, 75% are saying no. Yeah, that's kind of jumping around. That's. Uh, I think it's hard to standardize oh, without any type of template. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Do you, do you think that has to do with whether people are in more of a production mode, say with you know a big project or a, a series of grants or something like that, or whether they're still in their in the research phases of developing their methods and stuff. Well, I think you know, I I don't have a good answer, but I would suspect that in many of the research publications uh, we have such a transient workforce that uh, in graduate students and postdocs that everybody kind of does their own thing instead of trying to standardize across the lab. And I find it very difficult to, in my lab to do that. And, to, and that's kind of why we try to use a template, uh, at least for the metadata. So, okay. Next question. Do you encourage or require authors to adhere to general metabolomic standards when reviewing manuscripts for publication?
So 45% are saying yes, but we're, we're still at 59%. So please vote on this one. Um, Yeah. All right. So we have, yeah, we have mixed opinions there. So, um, so maybe in the question and answer time, we can discuss some of these issues of um, why are, are people, uh, you know, you know, in reviewing uh, manuscripts, for example, not requesting standardization or of, of content. Um, so, okay. Okay, so moving on, um, just kind of as a bridge into our, our um, question and answer time, I'd kind of like to pose the questions, why you or why are you not using the MSI, MSI guidelines? Um, do you believe they're too rigorous? Do you believe they're too time consuming? Um, uh, what can we do to help? better define standardization in these guidelines. And so with that, I come to the end of my presentation, and then we can go to the, the question and answer time So and begin to open the discussion. Um, I don't know, Dan, do you think it would be worthwhile to, to review the final outcomes of the poll questions uh, as part no, we of could, this? We could, we could do that. Uh, if you want to say something or uh, participate, you need to go and, and raise your hand. And that way then we can unmute you. Uh, it should be in your uh, control panel for the webinar. Uh, and we'll monitor those. Um, yeah, so we can go back. Uh, do you want to go back to the beginning of the um, poll or do you want to pick up the at the middle? Uh, well, I think um, yeah, let's just start at the, the top, and that way everybody can see the quantitative numbers. So let's okay. see kind of how they fit in with the norm. All right, so that's question number one. Do I need to share the screen with you, or how do we? No, uh, people should be seeing the quick poll results right now. Okay. I see Reza has his hand up, so let's unmute him. Go ahead, Razor. Yeah, hi, hello. Thank you hello. for setting this up. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, I, as as Cosmos, you mentioned and Metabolite, a um, lot of question. I, I would think a lot of things have to have a practical application. I mean, we could write about and say about um, what is the best practices, or try to say follow certain guidelines, and these are the guidelines, but to enforce them make it easy for people to do, to make it systematic, to make it organized, to make people who have tools to be able to produce the result or for, provide a checklist. I think this is the hard part. But at the same mm -hmm. time, these are the, the low-hanging fruits. I mean, it, again, um, a lot of other communities, particularly I know about Proteomics community, have done that already. And there's a lot of these file formats, a lot of it's in validation tools, a lot of it are especially for um, data submission. I mean, you mentioned data submission, Metabolites, which is our repository DPI. Mm -hmm. I wish it was 1,000. No, we haven't reached 1,000. At best, okay. the public data sets combining uh, Workbench and us as the main repositories that have uh, metabolome data sets. I mean, there are others as well. We barely reach about 500. Um, so it's um, quite small compared to, say, if I talk about proteomics, one of the repositories have about 25,000 data share. Okay, they started a lot earlier, but still. Uh, so all, all of it is an evolutionary process. I mean, uh, setting up the guidelines, having a means to implement these gu guidelines, having tools that can provide a checklist, having journals to require it in, in terms of structure. I mean, you said journals. I We have uh, metabolomic journals. They have, is it compliant by MSI? But is it yes or no? I can't say yes or no because what is the matrix? What is the index? If, if it's 70% is a yes or where is the cutoff? How can I validate it against? 
And well, I, I realized that in the question, and so that's why I say near compliant MSI data. And so it's, I don't think we're going to see a, a, a dramatic change in black to white in, in a very short time. I think what we will see is a quantitative change over time where we begin to you know, uh, require more and people begin to follow more. And so uh, the Metabolomics Journal, I believe, is on, the only journal that I know of that actually does you know, query people and, and encourage them and almost require that they provide MSI compliant data. I think one of the things might be too that it's, people, because um, I, you know, the whole idea of these data standards came up about in environmental chemistry as well, and the U.S. government imposed, uh, the USGS imposed some metadata guidelines, and people found out that it, to do it well and to do it properly, uh, it's not a real false thing. Um, parts of it are easy to do, but to really do it well and, and, and to document properly, it's not a zero-cost thing. So people need to budget for that, I think, and, and to plan for it. I mean, the key thing for, for having a compliance data, standard data, is the data to, to, for it to become reproducible. So I want, if I have a data that is a reporting, that this reporting is complete, and follow certain guidelines, meaning that this data becomes more reproducible than if I give a lot of information but not enough for you to reproduce. Uh, so the, the key index for these things is how much of this data or how much of the results could be reproducible, and we need data for that. And as we all know, metabolomics data is very, very difficult to reproduce yeah. due to so many, many different reasons. So there's a lot of challenges, essentially. Well, you mentioned, uh, Riza, a checklist and, and making it easy on submitters. Can you maybe discuss what you, you're doing at Metabolites to, to help that? Do you provide a checklist? Do you provide templates? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, make it easier on submitters? Okay, we, we, we provide a tool that uh, provides a configuration file. These configuration files are based on um, the working groups of the 2007 reporting it is based on, so it's a practical compromise, which means that you only choose templates or uh, what you can fit in based on what is easy to do. Again, it's a um, difficult game because if you ask too much, you know, you, people will be put off if you have to fit in a lot of little boxes and say, oh, I can't, you know, I have to spend time as you know, Dan or Lloyd said, you need resources and time to do that. So we have a, a minimal, unminimal compliance. We now implemented a checklist and we try to work with that journal. So if you go through the process, you now see a validation tab. This validation tab gives you a checklist with crosses and and sort of um, color coded that uh, what type of information you're missing. So I think this validation for us was a good step in a way, visual way to see how much the data is complete. I mean, if you want to access the data, this validation tab, it now it gives another indicative of how much of these data set is complete. Um, we still, we have a quite a lot of uh, metadata, we're asking quite a lot of metadata, but a lot of it still is embedded in the formats which we can capture and enrich. Um, a lot of the technical instrumentation or a lot of it is depends on the type of formats people share as well. The hard part capturing is actually the experimental design and a lot of things going there. That requires a, quite a lot of work so and change in a way that people do in terms of having an understanding that it's sharing data it requires time and resources. I mean, we work with other repositories, Metabolink Workbench and, and, uh, and then the other one as well. So as long as you're happy with a certain template, whether that's ours or Bench, that's good because we can convert from one another. I mean, that's not a problem. As long as you have a template, even the Excel for template you show, that's perfect within the lab because what we can do later on convert that into a different formats and enrich metadata. So as you mentioned in your talk, it's good to have a template, whatever that template it is, and leave the job of converting to someone. <laughs> Hopefully that will work for you. But 
at least happy with one of the formats that are around there and, and give feedback. If you think this is bad or too much or too little, we can work on. And we need to build this via this uh, talks that you set up to get more people engaged and interested. And I'm, you mentioned task groups. It would be excellent if people from here hear about task groups, know about task groups, and they get involved and say, I can contribute to this part or I can do that part and eventually let the community grow. I don't want to talk too much, so please. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to reiterate uh, your, your opinion, and that is that uh, we need greater involvement from the community uh, in the area of task groups, but also <clears throat> in you know the behind the scenes. There's many things that we can do as a community to push forward the needs for standards, uh, and that is why I asked all the questions about reviewing and publishing, uh, because if, if as a reviewer, if we begin to ask for this type of information, uh, the journal begins to realize its importance without having to mandate that type of information. And then it actually helps us to, to move from one culture to the another uh, without being, you know, dictatorial. So, all right. Thank you, Reza. Great comments. Thank you. All right, Dan, we were oh, going to go to the poll yeah, question, or, or do we have other hands that, uh, that we need to address? I don't see any other hands up, so if you want to comment or have a question or anything, please go ahead and raise your hand. We do have some questions in the window that we'll go through in just a moment. Uh, we're on um, still showing the uh, quick poll results, uh, so the special issue of the metabolomics, which published the MSI papers, uh, that's what's up right now. About half of the people, a little over half the people have seen that or, or have read it or used it. And then, yeah. well, it, for that half that haven't, I, I would encourage you uh, to again go look at those papers, uh, pick the ones that are relevant to your to your work, and then begin to think about it and uh, think about incorporating standards into your uh, your workflow and your reporting. And more people have read uh, the metabolomic standard initiative papers in 2007, about 70%, so. Yeah. And then, uh, do you cite any of the metabolomic standards papers when you publish? 56% of people all said they do, so. And, Do you follow the MS guidelines, metabolomic standards guidelines when submitting a manuscript? 66% of those said they do. So I think we have a very, again, biased audience that people are very cognizant uh, of the metabolomics uh, standards initiatives. Uh. Right. And then uh, talking about your friends, what is the uh, percentage of publications that published near MSI compliant data? Um, most people, I think, 74% are saying less than 25% of the publications do that. So. Yeah, and that's kind of would be my uh, general view too, that a large number of manuscripts that are going in that are reporting metabolomics data do not, uh, you know, cite the metabolomic standards initiative, nor do they try to standardize the reporting of their data. So again, I, I think, think that this is a call to action. Uh, we would like to begin to change that. Right. And then the next question was the template question, and 73% of the uh, respondents don't use a template for submitting metabolomics data. Yeah. Well, um, I would again encourage folks to, to, to think about that idea. Uh, I'm willing to share our templates w with you. Um, as Reza said, uh, the database people would welcome data in that format that allows them to do more of the work. And so 
I've always thought of our lab as a portal to databases, and I really don't enjoy sitting there, you know, uploading all of the information. But if we can provide templates that they can then import, uh, that makes the job easier on everybody. Okay. And then finally, the last question was, do you encourage or require authors to adhere to general metabolomic standards when reviewing manuscripts? So yes, and sometimes got 84% yeah. response. So well, I think that's a good mix. Uh, I think that it's very hard to mandate, uh, you know, the enforcement of the standards. But you know, uh, it is good to encourage people uh, some of the time or all of the time. And again, I think it's a good way to to make the journals and journal editors more cognizant of of the standards and that there's a, a certain expectation from the peer review community that, these, uh, that they do begin to think about standards. Okay, uh, we have a hand raised from Mauro, uh, so let me unmute him, her. Okay, Mauro, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I really like this presentation. I'm quite begin on this field um, and I just look on the internet to try to find out some kind of templates. Uh, would we possibly to have some links that we can get uh, some of them or to take a look uh, how are the requests on, the, on it and so on? The uh, one template that I, one of the templates that I put up is uh, published. Uh, you can get it from Plant Fizz or ultimately, uh, yes, we can put up a template uh, from the published article on, on our website. You would be welcome to, to use it. Yeah, that would be really fine. So it's perfect for the beginners that they can take a look on what is it and um, what you can do then beforehand before we doing your work and sending your work for publication. Thank you a lot. Well, I would ask that others in the audience that might have similar type of templates, if you would be willing to share them, please send it uh, to us and we, we will upload it uh, on our webinar site. So. Yeah, that, that could be a good resource for the Metabolomic Society website as well, right? Yeah. Um, all right, so I see Reza's hand is up again. Did you want to say something, Reza? Something more? No, I didn't raise my hand. I didn't, didn't bring it down, sorry. But, oh, but uh, all right. I was wondering, I mean, one of the questions we're missing is how, how often do you share your data? Because, I mean, uh, having a template is good and uh, if you want to also share your data as well because in your template has to go there so I would really would have loved to have a question uh, there that are you have you shared your data are you sharing your data are you plan to share the data is any restriction on sharing your data and then it would have followed by then how which templates do you would prefer or which templates do you have to follow because uh, I think they still have quite a lot of resistance in sharing data in metabolomics although it's getting a lot, a lot easier, and more and more people are getting the benefits of sharing data. But, but well, um, I, I, was, I would be interested in knowing whether there's any success stories with someone taking some of the shared data and reanalyzing it. Because you know, when we go through our data, the details that we look for uh, are much more than can be captured in metadata. And so, whether a spectrum is bad or has some weirdness about it. Um, these are the things that are really hard to communicate. It's one thing to tell people some information about how you collected the data and so forth, but um, um, and so my question would be, are there success stories of uh, what's going on? Uh, yeah. Stefan Newman has his hand up as well, so let me unmute him. Go ahead, Stefan. Oh, Stefan says his microphone is not working. Yeah, well, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Does it work? Yes, I hear you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, in, in the questions area, uh, I posted a link uh, of a manuscript that was uh, just uh, went online in the Metabolomics Journal a couple of days ago, uh, which mainly came out of the Cosmos Consortium and is. Uh, a mixture of tutorial and review of the state of standards uh, in, in metabolomics. Um, and uh, towards the end, there is something where we have tried to put in uh, stuff where 
reuse, data reuse has actually uh, worked in the end. So uh, Roy Goodacre uh, and, and one of his, uh, people from his group had a very nice paper where they went into metabolites and they extracted a couple of studies there and tried different statistical methods uh, on those existing studies and showed what is uh, the different results that uh, are, are the outcome. Uh, a second example we have in the paper is the um, uh, reference spectra. There is one study in metabolites where people use that uh, with uh, existing tandem MSMS raw data and they used uh, some uh, clever R packages to come up with a mass bank reference spectra. So uh, from that data that had been public, people have created reference uh, spectra. And there was a third, oh yes, right, um, there was Jan Stanstrup in uh, Italy and he's working on mapping retention times between studies. Um, he had a paper on that in the analytical chemistry back in August. And um, many of the uh, studies that he used for uh, mapping and, and uh, assessing uh, the mapping of retention times between studies came from metabolites as well. So I think these are three great examples where the data out there has been reused by others, uh, other people than the depositors. Okay, good, great. Thanks for the timely uh, literature. Um, yeah, uh, and it really just came out uh, a few days ago, and uh, um, uh, it also has a lot of links uh, to, uh, that is also aimed at bioinformaticians. If they want to recycle uh, some uh, data that is uh, there in open standards, they should write their own parsers on that. But we have quite a few links on uh, how you can access either the isotope metadata standards or the uh, raw data standards and just incorporate that into your own uh, processing pipelines. And similarly, there is a list of uh, journals that uh, facilitate and uh, actually honor open, publication, open data publication. All right, thank you gentlemen for your feedback. Um, I think Razor makes a, a, an important question that is, and I apologize that we overlooked it, but how often do you share your data? Um, historically, uh, our, our, our goal is to publish, and we always publish our data with uh, the manuscript, uh, but we don't always, you know, submit those to databases. And so, um, are there any other thoughts uh, about that? Uh, any other feedback? Uh, about how others are sharing their data? I'm not seeing any hands go up, Lloyd. Um, I think there's that. Who is that? Um, okay. Well, again, uh, think about these issues and let's uh, maybe go to questions now. We've reviewed all the polls, and so I see a significant number of questions showing up. Yeah, so um, uh, Jen uh, Stanstrup had a couple of questions. Uh, one was a comment that um, metabolites was not mentioned, so I'm going to unmute him and, and see what he says about that. But um, but I think you did mention it quite favorably. Yeah, I, think, I mean, Lisa jumped in right after I wrote that, so I think it has been uh, covered now. Okay. okay. Well, it was actually in the presentation as well, so... Yeah, on the Cosmos slide, so... Yeah. Um, and then the other question is, uh, could you give an opinion on whether or not the community is ready for imposing strict requirements, uh, non-negotiable yes. requirements? Do you think that, it, that that is too big of a hindrance for many? Well, my personal opinion is, you know, we need to move forward uh, not in a strict manner, but in a positive manner, uh, in that we begin to ask uh, uh, authors for, you know, a standardized data. And, you know, we then have to look at their effort to meet with that. And as long as they're making a good faith effort to move towards standardization uh, and, and reporting, I think that, yes, that's, that's, that's what we're, where we should be at right at this point. I think if we jump from, you know, uh, immediately to strict requirements, then I think that it will be very difficult uh, and it, it would be pretty harsh on our authors. That's my opinion. Others? I 
just raise your hand so we can see that you want to contribute. I Man, I think that these things are progressive, right? So 10 years from now, it'll be just natural for people to uh, deliver complete metadata with their manuscripts, complete data sets with their manuscripts, um, even quality control data with their manuscripts. And, um, you know, so it, it's going to evolve. It's just a question of can we really accelerate it faster than we would like it, than it seems to be going. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Margaret Coe made a comment. Um, she's n new to metabolomics, two and a half years. Hadn't heard of the templates, though they seem like what I would expect people to be reporting. So um, let me see if I can unmute her. And um, Margaret, did you want to uh, comment on your point? Uh, just that the the the. Um the Tableau's issue where you've got the standards initiative is 2007, which is eight years ago, and a lot of people new to it would probably not have heard of it or gone that far back in the literature. Okay. Um, so, but all the stuff that's mentioned is just standard ordinary stuff that you'd expect people would be reporting or you'd hope they would be. That's all. Well, again, uh, that uh, was the purpose of this webinar is to review what's out there and then, uh, you know, encourage people to begin or to continue, uh, you know, practicing uh, the reporting of data in some type of standardized format. So thank you, Margaret, for your comment. Okay. Um, Simone uh, Rochefort also had a, a comment. Um, I think for most of these questions, I would say it depends on the paper, and my answer would be mostly. Simone, do you have a comment there? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep, great. Uh, yeah, I think really for you know some of those questions about um, when you request people to submit their standards and so on. It does depend on the type of paper and the journal that you're reviewing for, to a certain extent. Uh, I think uh, the standards definitely are important, and my group um, tried to implement Isotab for quite some time before going to a different format with an in-house metadata capture system that um, worked better for us, just because we had multiple users trying to submit data. But um, I think definitely standard ontologies like those captured in Isotap are very nice as well. So would you expand on, um, you know, the concept of where you think the, what journals would be more appropriate for reporting standardized data and what journals would be less appropriate for reporting standardized data? Uh, so some of the more um, I guess the metabolomics focused ones, obviously, very strong encouragement for people to report all their data properly there. With um, some um, other journals, say, less metabolomics focused, but where they might use some data that you might say is borderline metabolomics, if not metabolomics, you would encourage them to do the basic reporting standards. So. And mostly people do describe their experiments in reasonable detail, if not meet all the um, suggestions outlined in those early 2007 papers. For journals like, you know, Ag Food Chem and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray, you had your hand up, so. Yes, I mean, um, I'm just going to talk about our experience with journals. Uh, again, nicely summarized in the same link that Stefan sent. We tried to actually work with them. It's very difficult. I mean, they say, yes, we will recommend that you uh, deposit data into it. But journals will not, as far as I can tell, enforce the compliance. They will leave that for reviewer, and then the answer from that will be, yes or no, it's not how much it complies or not. So 
journals are taking very um, cautious uh, approach to this, that they will say yes, we will recommend a repository, for example. Uh, yes, we want them to comply, and we put the MSI guideline into our text, but but it's very different to enforcing it or to checklisting it. There is nothing for them to say, well, if you do, how much was that, and what's there, and what's missing, and that's the hard part, which I think, if I understood, many journals do not want to go down that road, and they leave that for reviewers, but reviewers also don't have time or the energy or... or how 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 deep you want to go into the data sets, for example? It's not very easy. Well, I, I think there's two points there. Number one, um, a journal looks at it. If, if if they have to do anything to validate what's submitted or even to communicate and require it, that's a cost item for them, and they have to recoup that in some way, much as other people do. Um, for these types of activities, so it's a cost or item to them. But then, also, they have uh, a bit of a, a, I don't know if it's a conflict of interest, but if, if they become too stiff-necked and people take their manuscripts to other less strict journals, that you know, so they have a bit of a disincentive to be the policeman for this. I've heard I've heard other people uh, saying, well, we could make the journals do this. this. They're the proper ones to do it. Well. Uh, they want people to submit, and if they get a reputation as being so difficult to get this uh, metadata or data through, um, maybe they become less impactful at that point. Well, I agree. The journals are somewhat reluctant to impose any type of standards, but there, I think there are numerous examples uh, where journals have. Uh, you know, many of the plant upper end plant journals that, uh, that we publish in. You know, they require you to submit your, you know, your gene sequence to GenBank. Uh, they, um, you know, some of them now have proteomic standards, and you know, they have microarray standards, Miami type standards, and so I think it's 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 part of the evolutionary process. And as our metabolomic fields grow, that it is likely that the higher end journals will require this, and and it will just stem out of, you know. The reviewers, as, as has been mentioned, but as a, a, as reviewers, as we mentioned this over and over again, there's going to be some recognition of the journal that these are important uh, quality standards that we need to to uh, add to our list to make sure that we maintain quality publications. All right. Um, I don't particularly see any. Um other technical or pointed questions, um, Lloyd. So, uh, if you want to ask something, please put your hand up. Simone, go um, ahead. Uh, yeah, I agree with Lloyd. I also think that there's a big difference between submitting your data, or, uh, metadata, in a form that's, I uh, guess, <laughs> compliant and easily digested by the community. Uh, as opposed to submitting raw or processed data, that's a much bigger ask and takes a lot more time, I guess, depending on how large a study is for people to comply readily with that. Yeah. So I don't know if there's um, some methods where, I know proteomics, for example, often require you to upload your raw or processed files to certain repositories. And um, people in my lab, that's taking literally days to do, which is a bit of a disincentive for people to do that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the the um, the barrier that's associated with sample submission can be a, a, a big problem, and it can prevent people from submitting. Um, I made a suggestion at an NIH meeting last week or earlier this week that the database folks become more proactive where they go and seek out the data from the community and that was not received very well and maybe okay. Reza would comment on that. Uh, yes, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking that exactly the same. I mean uh, from our experience she started from really chasing people for now three years to get the data shared and we do accept any form of Data. I mean, we can, if you're willing to share your raw files, which we kind of uh, require now, 
to different stages of data. So there's no limitation from our side on how much you want to share. You want your QCs, you want your blanks, you want your uh, ref, how do you run, because these are all important to, for the data to be reproduced. So from our side, repository side, and that I am assuming, and I would, I am know in a way that it goes for all repositories, there is no limitation. And as you mentioned, limitation is the time that it takes. Uh, these tools will develop. They will be, yes, they will be bits of trouble with these, it be maybe too much, they are not the best tool to capture a lot of this information, and user experience tells if you use one thing, you didn't like it, you probably move away from it, but the tools will evolve and will change, and they, they will be the ones that become the most popular will grow, even though they might be very difficult tools to use, for example, if that's the case, but if it's very, very popular and everyone uses it and journals accept the formats, then that type of format will proceed and becomes more acceptable. And then other people will make tools that can actually convert or use LIMP system, lab information management system for larger labs or use other tools that can generate that type of data sets as long as you capture these data sets. So as, as everyone mentioned here, that is, it is a lot of evolutionary process going. So we are very early on, but or sort of in progress, but I'm hoping yeah. this thing will change collectively. Well, in, in my opinion, there's been a little bit of a lull in, in the progress of the standards. Uh, we had a very big uh, push uh, in, you know, in you know, 2005, five seven, uh, but you know, things have kind of been silent for the last, you know, many years, and so I think uh, reinvigorating this discussion, uh, beginning to push a little bit harder, uh, it's, it's time for that. So. Well, uh, Reza, one of the things you said, talking about uh, the concept of limbs, um, you know, those are quite advanced in numerous fields, and I've, I've tried to use some, and I've built some myself, and uh, and that's actually not a good thing because what happens typically is that the limbs really, uh, I mean, it can be good in a high throughput, say, clinical uh, process, it, it's really good. But um, what happens is that the limbs will define the workflow. And so those of us who, are, who think we're doing research will kind of chafe when there's a limbs imposed on us because often that does... Uh, bring some requirements that we would like to avoid, for example. Um, I mean, it's great when it works because the data is there, it's readily available, and it, it's a powerful tool, but limbs, uh, metabolomics limbs will change, will change someone from being a researcher to a production person. <coughs> right. so with that said, I think... Go ahead. Sorry, there are, there are workflow managers as well. I mean, there are a lot of, lot of other tools coming up, uh, and these tools evolve and, uh, and agree. If you buy a tool that is not purposely set up for metabolomics, then it will, can cause more hindrance rather than a tool or limbs that specifically was designed, for example. Uh, one that designed for metabolomics would be much better because a lot of the commercial tools, tools uh, limb system, sorry, they're not specifically for metabolomics, so it can can kind of adopt to it. I mean, maybe that would be one issue. Uh, but then again, I mean, any any workflow manager or any digital form of capturing that uh, it depends. On, you can scale it from small lab to larger labs or medium-sized labs, and it can do other than using a lab book, a digital form would actually lower the barrier of submission that you can convert this metadata at some point or another uh, to a digital form. And that digital form is the key because that's when your data becomes searchable, becomes accessible, so people can actually find your data or your result. There are a lot of things that are going on in different communities and mm -hmm. it's um, hopefully things will go a bit faster if, if out of these meetings is actually getting more people interested and involved and more messages out, I guess that's, that's, that's really would be helpful to, to restart these discussions. Uh, into well, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the topic of uh, the spreadsheets and, and um, 
thick lists and like that, those are really important even if they're done ad hoc in a desktop tool like Excel or something like that because once you once you have a system that works for you, uh, you know, so if there's a paper trail that you can document that works for your research, then that's what the LIMS people should be, uh, the LIMS designers should be interested in seeing. Um, if you have someone uh, say, hey, I, I did a workflow for you, um, the first thing you should put into their hands or into their face should be your workflow, which is your spreadsheets, your worksheets that you use to do your work. And uh, so anyway, that's just my opinion. There, there's a big social, uh, there, there's a whole community that deals with the implementation of LIMS in all kinds of systems. And there's a huge social uh, science that's behind it to make them successful. Mm -hmm. And I don't know them all, but I, I, I know that uh, it can be, it can be touchy. Well, I think I personally would welcome a, a LIMS type of system that's focused on metabolomics. Um, sure. The com comment earlier was that you know that you know that kind of pushes metabolomics from a research environment into a production environment, and uh, I kind of agree with that statement too. But uh, you know when we're doing large-scale profiling and omics type of uh, of experiments, that in itself that is a, a a production type of scale uh, or a larger scale and so I think that uh, it would be very valuable to have a limbs and I think that many of us that are doing metabolomics really are already at a production level you know we're, uh, an experiment might be 50 to 100 or several hundred samples and a limbs would be beneficial so. right right now you begin to see the need for keeping all that stuff straight when you get to those scales for sure Okay, I think that uh, we are at the end of our questions, correct? I don't see any hands up. Last chance to raise your hand electronically. Uh, oh, Simone, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just I think the good idea of um, putting some of those even basic Excel spreadsheets up, either on the metabolomics website or somewhere really accessible would be good. Even then if we could just capture or let people capture the basic metadata um, as opposed to all the experimental data per se, at least if we have those simple forms, people maybe would feel more comfortable submitting those with their manuscript submissions or something like that. Again, we'll be happy to post the couple that I suggested. Um, you know, I don't know if Razor can send us uh, his checklist or anything else that we could actually post, but we'd be happy to do that too. <coughs> All right, so um, we're at uh, an hour and 17 minutes now. I think uh, things are coming to a close, so I would like to thank everybody for their, their time. Thank you for their participation. Thank you for your feedback, and uh, we look forward to future discussions in the area of metabolomic standards. So take care, all. Thank you.